Hello everybody, as I finished doing my hair. <laughs> um, <laughs> very happy to introduce Louise Oscar, that was very professional, sorry. Um, very happy to introduce Louise Oscar, who's joining us for tonight's water chat. That is often an introduction to yourself and your book. Uh, hi, <laughs> my name is Louisa Scar. Um, I'm an author. I live in Hampshire um, with my child who is on the monitor, fingers crossed, and my dog who is down here. I'll show you if anybody's interested in the dog. Where is he? There he is. I'm always interested in a dog. Staring, staring up at me. So hopefully he won't be too much of a pain. Um, I write the Butler and West series uh, published by Canelo. So it began with... Um, the last place you look which is this one and the followed by this one and followed by this one which is blink of an eye um blink of an eye um begins so the whole series follows two detectives uh ds robin butler sorry dogs not behaving and um dc Freya west and the whole series begins as they first start working together. But by the time we get to Blink of an Eye, they've, they've sort of worked together for a while and they know each other quite well. A little, Maybe they're getting to the point they know each other a little bit too well. And Blink of an Eye begins on Christmas Day when um, Robin Butler is called out to uh, five unresponsive bodies found on a beach. And by the time he gets there, four uh, have been taken to hospital and one has been declared dead. So... Um, yeah, the story follows that investigation. They go to the, so Freya and Robin go to the hospital to inter to interview the four survivors. And they soon realise that um, although these people claim they're friends, there's something a little bit funny going on. Um, they're a bit sketchy with the detail. They don't want to share much. So that there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a history. And um, yeah, so the book sort of follows that history. So it's all about sort of, um, as a cold case, a bit about sort of lost love, um, a long held grudges, and uh, these five friendships and how they've sort of evolved over 20 years. So yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. That sounds good. Um, how many of you planning to write in the Butler and West series? Uh, we've got five. So I'm editing number four at the moment and then I've got to write number five. So four comes out in November and then five comes out uh, next year at some point. So yeah, at the moment we're planning five. <laughs> and will it definitely have ended then? Do you think? Will you bring it to an end or are you going to leave it so you could go back at another time? Um, I thought, I think never say never. There is a certain, there is a certain arc, shall we say, a character arc with uh, Butler and West, which I've always planned over five books. So I've always um, ended up that, that, that so, sorry, that's how it would go. Uh, but as to what happens after that, I'm not really sure. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. I'm certainly very attached to the characters. It will feel a bit weird, I think not not writing them anymore i feel a bit odd to let them go but yeah i've got a bit too attached to robin i think <laughs> what ideas have you got for like after you've finished do you think you'd be you'd write a standalone or you plan um yeah so i um so I'm just giving the dog treats to keep him quiet, hence I'm not eating, I'm just moving treats to the dog. Um, yeah, so I have, yeah, I've got a variety of ideas. I've got an idea for another series um, and I've got an idea for a couple of uh, a couple of standalones, quite a few ideas actually. Me and my agent are sort of working through things at the moment, so deciding what comes next and what I fancy doing. So um, yeah, we will see, we will see. No shortage of ideas, just shortage of time to actually write them unfortunately which always seems to be the case with me anyway i think it is uh, what's your writing process like then talk us through your um uh how i write so um i've usually got an idea of a couple of the scenes so um often how it starts so i often have an idea about the pro what the prologue is and then um, I've got a picture of maybe a few of the interactions, a few of the characters. Obviously, Robin and Freya stay the same. And there's a whole supportive cast that sort of supports them, that the detectives, they all stay the same. But the victims sort of change. Um, so with Blink of an Eye, I think I knew, I knew about the beach and I always had an idea what, what the reveal was I guess um so uh, then I just write a base draft so I just write very very quickly fingers on keyboard just bash out basically sort of 60 70 thousand words very quickly so like three thousand four thousand words a day um and then I go back 
and look at it and start to plan. So it ends up looking a bit like that. So if you can see that, that's what's on the wall at the moment. So it starts as sort of like scribbles, just um, like ideas and thoughts and stuff like that. And then I plot it all out properly. This is book four, because I'm working on that at the moment. And it ends up uh, like that. So each, each card is a chapter and each colour is um, a character. So I don't change point of view in each chapter. Each chapter has one character's point of view. And then each little, you can see they've all got little sticky tabs on them. Um, that are they are the the clues that link, and then I go back and edit the whole lot according to that plan. And that that structure that I use is a um, quite a standard three act structure. So if you've read like Save the Cat or um, any of those sort of standard structures, if you watch any film, you'll see the same structure, any Hollywood film, and it's the same sort of thing. So it has like it has turns at the act one, act two, it has a midpoint reversal, it has a you know, it's a very standard structure, but it seems to work. So and then you end up with that. Um, and that's it. And that whole process takes about 10, 10 weeks, 10, 11, 11 weeks. Um, so, yeah, it's fun. And then I give it to my editor and get in your bed. Um, and she comes back and tells me what needs to be changed. So then it all starts again. <laughs> so it's fun. Yeah. What? Well, how did you happen upon that process as your way of doing it? Uh, just trial and error to be honest I sort of I guess it's just what works for me I know some people plot the whole thing out from the beginning but I just can't I can't see the story until I'm writing it until it sort of starts to come out and the characters start to sort of do what they want to do so um sorry the dog's not getting uh so yeah I can't really see it until until I start writing and then it all becomes very clear and um yeah they take on a bit of a life of their own and away it goes so I don't know it's just trial and error I think what works what works for me and I need I need the board because I can't hold everything in my head so it's sort of yeah and then and away we go <laughs> at what point do you start doing the research on things like procedure or the forensics or anything like that the what, sorry, the other thing? Procedure and the what? Like forensics and things like oh, that. Oh, um, procedure I'm pretty good on nowadays. Uh, having written a few, I'm, I'm quite good on police procedure. So generally it doesn't differ that much. Um, forensics, again, I have a book. Where has it gone? This one. Ooh. Which is very good for dead people, believe it or not. So Simpsons Forensic Medicine. It's, um, it's it, You can't really read it unless you're got a strong stomach but it's um basically the textbook for forensic pathology so anything dead that's what you need um the rest so blink of an eye what did i have to research for blink of an eye <laughs> frostbite weirdly um so one of the characters has gets frostbite and i had to do a lot of research into frostbite and i think what else was there oh yeah there was a whole there's a whole nother thing which I won't say because it, that's a massive spoiler, but I read about three or four books on that topic. Um, so I had to get, it, you know, a bit detailed. But normally I'd start, I do the base draft and that's normally got a lot of holes in it, like me putting in little square brackets, research or what or question mark, check things. Um, and then, yeah, I go back and I do the research to fit. If I do the research first, often I find... I over explain things just because I want to use the research, if that makes sense. I get a bit overexcited about the research and like whack it all in. And then I have to say, actually, you don't need to know about X, Y, and Z. You just need to know about this and this. And then um, I've got a couple of experts who sort of help me out. So I've got a, a cop friend who helps me out, answers my questions. I've got a doctor who helps me out and answers. So anything to do with the frostbite, he was really helpful on. Um, like how long have they been hospital and I need this guy to stay in hospital how can I keep him there sort of thing what injuries must he have for him to stay in hospital for that length of time because often that's the problem you want somebody somebody somewhere <laughs> for a length of time you want to keep them there what's the most interesting kind of research rabbit hole you've been down um yeah um I did a lot of research on serial killers that's very interesting um but that's that's sort of on the side um I'm trying to think what oh this one was so um under a dark cloud was really interesting because um it's all about a storm 
and meteorology and obviously I don't go into too much detail meteorology but um, all that stuff about storms and two of my two of my good friends are doctors in meteorology so that helped um, but yeah that was that was really interesting to find out all about that and how storms work and I must admit I wrote I was writing this stuff about how thunderstorms occur and I just sent him a note saying, I don't understand this. I'm never going to understand this. Please, can you explain this in this paragraph? And he had to re rewrite a section of the book for me because I was just like, just, <laughs> just is beyond me. I don't understand. I will never understand it. Just write it for me, please. And he did. He did. Bless him. <laughs> I'm mesmerized by how colour coded your books are on your shelves. They're good, aren't they? I don't have quite enough books actually. Actually, the blacks are starting to take over on the middle shelf. I need to maybe need to rebalance them. But um, yeah, I, I can't. You can never find anything. It looks pretty, but I was looking for a. Um, I knew I had uh, Jack Reach's Killing Floor. I knew it was there, and I thought it was orange, and I couldn't find it for like a day. Um, but it is there. It is orange. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they're very pretty. It's a wonderful procrastination exercise. I was going to say, it must have taken you ages to sort out. I feel like yeah, I used to, and I used to have them um, top to bottom rainbow as well. So with sorry, what's my son doing? Nothing. Um, I used to have them top to bottom, so like black at the top and then going down, and then I just swapped them all around. So that was a nice day of like rearranging books. It was good, good, good procrastination. Lie down. Is that what you do when you're like stuck on a plot point? Um, no, I go. I generally go for a run, take the dog out, just or make a cup of tea. Like actually, the running is the is the best. Um, if I ever stuck, I just go for a run. And normally, by the time I get back from the run, it's all like it's all sorted out. It's uh, yeah, it's the, the running's definitely um, definitely better. How did you happen upon Canelo then, as your publisher? Um, just through. So I got my agent. I used to write under a different name. I used to write as uh, Louisa Delange and I got my agent through those books, just um, submissions pile. So slush pile, basically. He just kind of read my first book, which was called The Dream Wife um, and he liked it. And he, so he took me on based on that book. We sold it to Orion, which is um, part of Hachette. And then when we were out of contract, there's a dog here. Say hello, Maxie. <laughs> hello, Max. Um, when we were out of contract, we just um, yeah went through the normal sub submissions, and um, Canelo liked uh, Last Place You Look and offered me a yeah a five book contract. So that's how Butler and West came came to play, and uh, yeah, it's great fun. And they 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 work very quickly, which I really like because I'm I'm quite quick in terms of turnaround. Like I I write more than I couldn't write one book a year. I'd have nine months to do nothing. <laughs> so I like how quick Canelo are. Like they're very, they're very efficient. And um, yeah, so we do about one book every six months with Canelo, which is good. What did you write as your, um, so you said you wrote as a different name. What kind of books did you write those? Were they crime as well or a totally different genre? Uh, yeah, so Dream Wife was actually a speculative psychological thriller. So it's um, a psychological thriller, but it's got an element of, oh, I've gone. No, you're still there. Am I still there? Oh, it's gone, mm -hmm. it's gone on my screen. Um, so it has an element of uh, speculative science fiction in it. Um, so yeah, why is that? Well, my screen's gone funny, sorry. I don't know why that's happened. Um, yeah, so slightly different. And then I moved from that to, actually I submitted a book and my publisher, editor at the time, said, actually, what you've written is a police procedural. I was like, oh, OK. I didn't know anything about police procedurals. And um, yeah, did a bit of research, read a few and said, oh, OK, yeah, I have I have just written a police procedural. <laughs> and um, yeah, then I then I just got hooked on writing cop books. So um, off I went. So I wrote two with them. And then obviously we've we've got five with with Butler and West. So, yeah, just really enjoy it. <laughs> Sounds good. How do you find being published by someone like Canelo as compared to being with a bigger publisher like Orion? Um, the speed is very different. 
So the speed they turn things around, obviously that no, no, enough. Come on, go in your bed. Um, they, they, you know, they turn things around very, very fast. They have numbers um, like at their fingertips. Um, they're very good at the ebook side, as you'd expect, because they're, you know, they're a digital first publisher, so they know exactly what they're doing in terms of advertising and Amazon stuff and all that sort of thing. Um, I do like I do like traditional publishers though as as well. So yeah, I I I enjoy both to be honest. I've always enjoyed both. Uh, it's just a slightly different process, but yeah, you get used to it. Speed. The main difference is the speed. Because Canelo were very quick, but yeah. Which, as we've discovered, works for you and your your kind of process. Yeah. and the process, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so now things are opening up again. Are you going out to do author talks and things? Uh, yeah, I've done a few. Yeah. So I just came back from Crime Fest uh, in Bristol which is the festival there, which I really enjoyed. I've never been to Crime Fest before, but yeah, it was it was really good fun. Um, I'm going to Harrogate and Capital Crime and uh, yeah, so definitely going to those two. Um, yeah, a few more, not not excessively, I must admit. I think we're finding, so I did a, I did a recent talk at Waterstones. I think we're finding it slightly, it's still a little bit slower than it was still slightly less people going out and wanting to do things face to face because the thing is you can now that everyone's got used to doing things online it's so much easier it's so much like you know more accessible when it doesn't take up your whole night you can just do you know quick chat and you know it's, it's it's really it's really good it's really nice to be able to do that yeah i've been to an event at waterstone <coughs> since things opened back up or a couple of different things and they've both had a lot less people. Yeah, it's, it felt very quiet before. Yeah, I think it's slowly picking up again, but it's, it's definitely quieter than yeah it ever has been before. But, but yeah, yeah, it's I, good. It's good. We'll get there, won't it? Uh, Sam is going to Capital Crime, so you'll have to say hello to her. Oh, okay. Excellent. Oh, yes, I think I saw your. I think I saw Sam's name on the um. The many, many names that scroll through. <laughs> yes, I recognise the name. Yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, we'll have to definitely have to say hello. And we're yeah. both going to Harrogate. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to be at Harrogate. It's going to be, it's going to be good. I went last year and it was quite quiet because I think it was just as things were opening up, um, and it was very quiet. But no, really looking forward to Harrogate. That'll be fun. That'll be yeah, fun. I'm just going to go for a day, but I missed it. Like, I was going to go last year, but I got pinged. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm too far away. I'm Southampton, so it's it's like there's no way I can go for a day. <laughs> I, have to go, I have to go for the whole weekend. It's like four hours, five hours in a car. So there's no way I'm. Yeah. Uh, it's an hour on the train from where I live. So. Oh well, that's all right. Yeah, no, you can definitely go for a day then. No, mm -hmm. but even capital crime, I'm going for the whole weekend. I could possibly just go for the day. <laughs> yeah, well, you might as well just go and enjoy it. It's yeah, cool. it's like a little holiday. It's nice. It's good. It's a good atmosphere. I, I really enjoy them. So, uh, yeah, they're good fun. They're good fun. And hopefully there'll be um, some Canelo authors there who I missed last year. So, yeah, it'd be good to meet up with some of them. Do you have a good network with the other kind of Canelo authors? Um, not with the Canelo, because I've never met them, to be honest. I speak to them a bit on Twitter, just kind of in passing, you know, as you do. But I've never met um, any of the Canelo team. No, I only just met my editor because um, we we obviously signed the contract in lockdown. So we never met. Um, so I only just met her, I think, a couple of months ago, which was really nice. Um, but yeah, I've got a network of other writers who I sort of... I meet up with at these events and sort of hang out with, which is really nice. Um, some people from my older Ryan days and then other, other friends. So yeah, that makes it, that makes a difference, I think, to, um, to enjoying these events. If you know there's a whole group of people that you can like meet up with and have a nice chat with, then, yeah, makes a big difference. Yeah, so one of my favorite questions recently is what have you read this year that you've really enjoyed? Read this, oh, I'm terrible at this question. What have I read this year? Oh, I have read. 
Oh, I've got a dog again. Um, I've read loads of stuff. I For Crime Fest, I had to read um, some new authors. So I read um, Russ Thomas's um, DS Adam Tyler series. So I started, I started with number three because that's what I was sent. Go in your bed. Um, and then I went back and read the beginning. So I really enjoyed those. And I also had to read Thomas Enger's uh, Blix and Ram series. That was really good. I'm just reading all of those at the moment. Um, what else have I read? I spent a lot of time reading those. I'm trying to think what else. It's been mainly crime, actually. A lot of crime. Normally I try to balance it out with some other stuff, but because of the events. Um, I just finished The Jigsaw Man, which I really enjoyed. Uh, what else have I read? I need to turn that and have a look. I've got a couple of things. I've got a whole list of stuff which I'm desperate to read, but I haven't got around to it yet. So I've got, I've still got um, Cara Hunter's The Whole Truth to read, and then I've got her new one on Proof, which I need to read. Um, what else have I got? A couple of ones. I've got Sarah Pierce's. I've got The Sanatorium, which I haven't read, and then her new one, which I need to read. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm woefully behind on my reading. I'm reading, at the moment, I'm reading 12 Secrets, which is by Robert Gold. That's very good. So far, hasn't finished yet. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, but yeah, that's been very good. So all all crime. I need to read some, mix some other stuff in. What did I read recently? I must have read some other stuff recently. Oh, I read Harriet Tice's um, It Ends at Midnight and Rachel Block's The Fool. That again, they were very good. Yeah. My read of the year what? has been Lessons in Chemistry. Yeah, I haven't read that yet. I've seen really good things. Lie down. Lie down. <laughs> he's not behaving but here he is there he is there he is i think he's just too distracted by all the strings he's a, we can hear well he's he's a spaniel and he thinks it's all about him because every time i'm talking he's thinking i'm talking to him so yeah lie down lie down and he's still really a puppy so yeah but no lessons in chemistry i i need to read i've heard really good things yeah i'd like to read that we talked before, I'm sure, the last time we talked, you were telling us about how you'd cast kind of Butler and West, don't you? Have oh, like, yeah. You have, definitely have, like, in mind who would play them, don't you? Yes, yeah, so um, they're here, actually, on the wall. Let me turn it around so you can see them. Um, can you see them? There they are. So I have little, it's really sad, I have little pictures of the people that would play them. I'm just going to ignore the dog now and see if that makes any difference. Um, so yeah, Butler is definitely Sam Worthington, although Sam Worthington has a very broad Australian accent, which doesn't really work. But um, yeah, Sam Worthington with a British accent. And then Freya is, um, she's Anna Torf, but Anna Torf's a bit old for her now. So a young Anna Torf. Um, but uh, yeah, they're on, the, they're on the wall. It's really just an excuse for me to look at some pictures of Sam Worthington all day, I think. Um, but any other books I write, because I've got a whole row of them across here, which is also there's a wall in front of my desk. So the other books I write, I have the same, I have the same process. It helps to, I think very visually, so I think it helps to imagine them by having these very attractive men in front of me. It's, it's terrible, <laughs> terrible <laughs> way of working. It's a real hard <laughs> Sorry? The real hardship is it? It's awful. It's awful. And then, of course, I have to watch all the films as well, so I can really get a good, you know, grip of what these very attractive men look like. So I've watched like entire of Sam Worthington's back catalogue, um, some of which are good, some of which are not so good. They're variable, um, but yeah, it's not. It's not a bad life. It's not a bad life. <laughs> it's awful, really. <laughs> But yeah, he's very, Butler is very much, is always very much, I have him on my phone as well, that's the other terrible thing. There's a screensaver on my phone and on my computer. <laughs> but it's sort of like a ritual, like I swap it over when I'm working on a particular book, I swap it to a particular picture and a particular actor. So, so that it's like a, like drawing a line in the sand in my head. It's like, right, that book's finished, now you do that one. So yeah, it works. <laughs> so when you're writing a series, thinking about how visual you are, do you use real locations for all your places? Uh, yeah, so um, sometimes I'd have to change them, just the name of them, just because I think sometimes they wouldn't appreciate 
having this place used. Um, but so in last place you look, the dead body is found in the Premier Inn in Winnell, which I don't know whether they mind, uh, but it, that's where it's found. Um, Under Dark Cloud is based very much on a car park in Reading, so the Oracle car park in Reading, which isn't the, the best spot, but yeah. And then Blink of an Eye, um, the beach I use is Cowshot Beach. So anybody that knows Southampton, there's a beach, a pebble beach, which looks a bit like the cover, to be honest. They looks a little bit like that. Um, and yeah, I used Cowshot as the base for where they're found which is always quite nice. I'm trying to think of the other locations I use. Oh, um, Portswood. Yeah, so all the action, so that the people in Blink of an Eye, the, the victims as such, went to university in Southampton and lived in Portswood. So the um, house that they live in is actually the house that I lived in. Um, so 28 Shakespeare Avenue in Portswood. So I use that house and then I talk about things like, yeah, sorry, Portswood's a really big part of it. Talk about things like Waitrose and the Waitrose car park where another body is found. Uh, the, there's a pub in it, which actually is fictional. Um, I just made up the name for that. But yeah, I do use a lot of, of um, places I know because it's just, to be honest, it's just a hell of a lot easier for me. Because I can just go there and, you know, I'd love to base, some, base it in New York, but then, of course, I'd have to go there and I don't have the time or the money to go to New York. Sadly, I would like to. That should be my plan, start basing things in um, in nice nice areas rather than just Southampton. I was wondering if you also had, like, photos of the locations and things that you used, you know, because you... Yeah, I have to. I need to do... I am keep on intending to do, like, a behind-the-scenes thing on um, Instagram. But, yeah, I've got... Um, I did a like a little, I went down to Portswood and did a little recce of all the different places where they hung out. And um, yeah, so I've based, I've based books in sort of Southampton Common, um, Nowhere to Be Found, uh, which is a book I wrote on my other name as Louisa Delange was based, uh, begins in a lake just outside Ringwood that I used to swim in. I do still swim in it. What Allingham Lake, where they find a dead body in the lake. Um, i trying to think of the other locations I use in some of these. But I mean, Robin and Freya both live sort of Winchester way. So a lot of it's sort of Winchester um, under a dark cloud ends at sort of O'Neill's in Winchester. And then there's a bar that they go to, which I think I changed the name of. But uh, yeah. And then the one I'm writing at the moment, um, if anybody knows Southampton, there's an attack that happens in Leisure, down Leisure World in West Quay. So yeah. If you live in Southampton, you're definitely going to know a lot of the locations I use. No one's complained yet. Do you ever get people who've read them who write to you and sort of say, I recognise that location or I? Um, not yet, not yet. A couple of people um, have, but then it's, it's quite obvious it is the location. Like it's not, it's not hidden very well. It's just like blatantly, it's Cowshot Beach. <laughs> you know, I name it and say it's at Cowshot. So um, yeah, hopefully nobody would mind. I don't think they would. I think people generally often like to read things kind of set where they are or like to sort of know where a location is. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it does. It definitely helps because you can plot it out. I have just made up a region, like an area of Southampton, because it's a really, I've I'd called it like Southwood, which doesn't exist, but it's like, I keep on describing it as like the roughest area of Southampton. And I kind of figure if you live in Southampton, you necessarily wouldn't want the area you live in described as the roughest area so i just made up an area and said it's called southwood um although i have it in mind what it actually is but i figured no one would appreciate it <laughs> my husband is uh from hull and he says that hull is exceptionally proud of its rating as being the crappiest town in britain <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I checked, I checked with my policeman friend, and I said, is X the roughest part of Southampton? He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. But then I kind of felt bad. <laughs> so I thought, I won't, I won't. I named a couple of other areas, regions that they sort of rotate around. But I thought, when it comes to this particular area, and they just describe it as just like rough, rough as biscuits, um, I named, I renamed it. <laughs> yeah, I was being kind. Donna says, thought that was Luton. I think she's saying that's the crappiest town in Britain. It might yeah. be Hull. Yeah, I, I think, thought it was Slough, personally. I think, <laughs> I think Hull did lose crap town status. To be fair, actually, Hull's a really nice place as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, fair. I like it there. 
So Southampton's spectacularly dull, to be honest. Winchester's lovely. Winchester's very beautiful. But I mean, nobody comes from Southampton is going to appreciate me saying this, but it is spectacularly dull. Um, so, yeah, it's very hard to find any particular, you know, landmarks in Southampton, like West Quay or Leisure World or, yeah, it's, um, but, yeah, you know, it's where I live, so it's easiest. I can just kind of pop down to Leisure World and take a few pictures. And, but it helps to get a feeling of everything about it, like how cold it is and the sights and the sounds and the things you hear. Because you forget, like, unless you're standing there with a notebook going, oh, yeah, I can hear that and I can hear that and that's happening and... It's, um, yeah, it's really hard to get a grip on, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Donna said she thinks it was Aylesbury this year. It was the worst. And do they do it every year, a ranking of the shittest they places? They do a ranking every year. I think Bradford tends to score quite highly as well. Oh, from your really... oh it's from northern. Northern. It's not like, because there's a lot of good stuff about Bradford. Uh, Donna Sasha thinks it was Aylesbury this year and Luton was second. They're about 30 miles apart. Doesn't say much for this area. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't go. Anything above the M4 is northern to me, so I'm, I'm a clue. I'm definitely southern. <laughs> oh, and Luton's definitely southern. It's um, like the edge of London, isn't it? I think. Isn't it? A... North London. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm terrible. <laughs> No geography at all. No geography. I'm okay with geography, but I haven't been sort of south of about Manchester for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. 30 miles north of London. There we go. Donna knows where Luton is. Well, yeah, that's, that's where Donna lives. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, you definitely know then, Donna. No, so not, we definitely know. Not a clue. Anyway, it's probably not as shit as this area that I've made up in Southampton where all the drug dealers live and all the murders happen. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it helps. It well, I don't know if it, I I'm presuming it helps that you can then sort of go to your local bookstores and be like, you know, these books are set locally and does that help when you kind of try um, to market a book or it does a bit. I think it's I think it's really tricky. The market for books is really hard to get any sort of shelf space or any sort of traction. So yeah, I think it helps a bit but to be honest um these books are predominantly they sell better in ebook because that's the way the models i guess is built in canelo so it's it's a digital first they invest a lot of marketing in um in ebook um so it, it sells it's, they do sell mainly there but yeah it helps a bit i've got a local bookshop in portswood called october books and they've always been incredibly supportive and really helpful so yeah they're always lovely I do wander in and try and sign everything whenever I'm around, but yeah. <laughs> so you get a bonus of where you live, you have an independent bookstore. Yeah, it's not I live actually live in Romsey. Um, but yeah, so it's not it's not that close, but Romsey I don't think has a bookshop. Should really check. Um but yeah, it's it's October books have always been really, really great, um and really helpful. So yeah. There's um one in Winchester as well called PG Wells. An independent books drop there they're really good as well they've been great i think i've offended donna she lives in dunstable apparently <laughs> I have no idea what that is donna. Donna. you could just be making up words at this point dunstable's near luton though i think isn't it i know mean, donna's going to correct us again she will she will because i don't know that is just like honestly she could have just it, she could have said she lived in like the shire or something and i would have believed that as much as <laughs> <laughs> the hound is now quiet. Give him the treat. <laughs> Less rough. Oh, there we go. He might gone to sleep. He's been lulled to sleep by our um the dog. He I think it's just he gives up after a while. He's he no, he's got out of bed again. Um he just gives up and gets bored and it's the only thing that, that works. He's a spaniel, so you know you get what you, you get what you buy with a spaniel. You have to accept it, accept a certain amount of crazy. And I think actually the child's gone to sleep as well, so we're on to a winner now. Yep, child's asleep as well. <laughs> there you go, win all round. So, what <laughs> are you you working on book four at the moment? What have you written most recently that you can tell? Uh, so, what, you know, the yeah, most so recent one you've written. Uh, book four and um, book five. So I started book five. 
and then got distracted by um, Crime Fest. So I started, I wrote about sort of 25,000 words on book five, and then I've gone back to finish off number four. But I should finish number four sort of this week or next week, um, which is good. So number four is a lot of fun as well. It's about, um, trying to describe it, it's about a company um, in Hampshire, which is based on a real company that I used to work at, but um, less about that probably. So it's, it, this little company is run by um, two guys who met at university, one who is a tech, sort of tech genius, and they do like virtual reality software. And the other guy is the sales guy. And it's about those two and somebody breaks into one of their house and attacks their wife and steals all their laptops. And then they're trying to work out why this might have happened. And then it just sort of, everything just sort of unravels from there. So it's about this sort of, this virtual reality company, um, which I, again, really wanted to write about for a long time. But yeah, and then it's also interesting because the relationship between Robin and Freya develops in the blink of an eye and then comes to a bit of a, comes to a bit of a um, tipping point, I think, in book four. But um, but there's a book five, so there's it's not all not all resolved yet. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I really like book four, and then book five, I I need to get on and write it because it's sort of nagging at me now. I need to get on and yeah, book five is about a series of arsons. So did you fire. try out um, virtual reality in practice for book four? I'm not going to try. I ask you if you tried out arson, honestly. No, and <laughs> no, I haven't tried arson either. Um, uh no i haven't i just looked up a lot of the um uh a lot of the information about it a lot of the data on it i've got um three tech tech geniuses who helped me that i used to work with at this company and they sort of helped i said i basically said this is the story is this actually possible because it's got a MacGuffin in it um which i've never worked with before so a MacGuffin is like a thing that drives the plot forward. So if you think about Pulp Fiction, it's that suitcase, or it's um, it's something that everyone's looking for, basically. So it's got a MacGuffin in it, which is quite fun. I've never used one of those before in a book. So yeah, I was um, looking forward to sort of messing about and with that. Um, but no, I didn't. I didn't try any software. It's not really. It's not really important to the story. It's not like. It's not like they go into it or anything. It's just sort of the, the thing that the whole crimes are all based around it's not science fiction it's a detective novel it's the same but yes it's um it's fun and then i need to finish five but yeah <laughs> aggie has asked um how would you sell her on your books how would i sell aggie how would i sell the books to aggie um they are a lot of fun so the crimes are very original and you probably wouldn't have seen them before, but it's a lot of fun. I think the books hinge on the relationship between uh, between Robin and Freya. And I think as you read more of the books, you get more into invested in their relationship, I guess. So that's how I'd sell it. It's basically like a five book long love story with a whole load of deaths. <laughs> it's not selling it very well but it's it's they're they're all they're all really good fun and really easy to read and there's there's always lots going on i never make things simple i wish i had like one crime and it just follows through but there's always like stuff going on and um really fun things but yeah that's how i'd sell it really badly <laughs> sorry aggie <laughs> donna you would have had your rainbow question about the bookshelves answered if you'd been watching from the beginning because we talked about it then. Yeah. What's the question? Can we? Do the rank? Do they carry on? No, they don't carry on. Actually, that's that, there's only two shelves worth. Like there. Wait a minute. If I get out of the way, that's as far as they go down. And then any further, any further down is just uh, that's all my random crap books. And then this side is all the books that I've written. So, no, they don't carry on. And then a whole lot of books about murder and stuff down there. <laughs> which is the best, best bet really yeah 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 so i, I can i've only got enough books two, two bookshelves two bookshelves yeah i do yeah, see the it though i love your go on. donna says she's got shelf envy and i'm gonna agree with her they're so like it looks so awesome mine are just all in piles 
But then you can't find anything ever. <laughs> Every case you think, oh, maybe I'll just reorganize them so I can actually find a book that I'm looking for. And I think, oh, no. So Aggie mm -hmm. says, I like loads of dead bodies. Yeah, you see, my body count's are always high. <laughs> you might have sold her, see? You said it didn't work yeah. and then it worked. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I like, I actually, in book four, I don't kill anybody and I'm not quite sure what's wrong with me. It's like, oh, I'm slipping. Standards are slipping. I should have killed at least three people. But uh, no, I do like I do really like to kill a lot of people, unfortunately. <laughs> In really odd ways as well sometimes. But yeah. Yeah. My um in the first one, I um the the guy, the victim that, that dies at the very beginning is called um Jonathan Miller. And my brother in law is called Jonathan. And um so I had to check with him and say, Are you do you mind that a character's named Jonathan? And it wasn't named after him, but the character was so, like, he was just Jonathan Miller. He just was, that was his name. So I had to check and John was like, no, no, it's fine. And then he actually read the book and was like, oh, not sure I want to die particularly in that way, but, you know. <laughs> and then poor old Jonathan Miller gets mentioned in every book ever since. So it's like, oops. <laughs> but never mind. But yeah, he died um, in a sex game gone wrong. It's all a bit, it's all a bit grubby. <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> it wasn't his whole name though that he used, so it's mm. not too bad. No, no, no. My my brother-in-law's called Jonathan Scar, so no, it, I didn't. I didn't call him Jonathan Scar. <laughs> no, Jonathan and Miller was just yeah. Miller was just separate. So yeah. So a favourite book group question of ours is, have you ever acted out a scene as you've written it? <sighs> um, yeah, so oh, my poor husband gets a lot of questions and he's never, he never engages with them. He's always very boring. Um, but actually with poor old Jonathan Miller, I didn't act it out. I just say I didn't act it out. But because of the way he dies, he dies with a belt around his neck. And I had to get, I had a belt sat in my, in the office for ages because I was trying to get the, the way it hangs right and which way the knot, the, the buckle would be and all that sort of thing. I wasn't putting it around my neck because I thought that would be, you know, that would be the end of me. But um, I was kind of sitting there with a buckle going. <laughs> um, but I'm trying to think of anything else. I haven't acted out. No, I don't think I have. I did have a problem in um, Under a Dark Cloud. They... It all, it's a locked, so Under a Dark Cloud is a locked room mystery in a storm. So there's two of them, and when the storm goes away, they find um, one dead body and then another guy who's uh, very confused, can't remember what happened. And that's sort of the mystery, and obviously the, the guy that's alive gets arrested for murder. But the problem I didn't realise was that they're at the top of a multi-storey car park, and they're supposed to be in a, like a massive weather van. And then my friend, who is a 999 controller, and she works on, um, uh, d you know, getting getting very large vans to the top of weird places. She said, you'll never get, you would never get a large van to the top of a multi-story. And I was like, oh, shit. And then I had to work out, could they do this in a small transit? <laughs> so I had to then compress all this massive weather van into like a tiny, tiny transit that they could get to the top of a car park. So yeah, that I had to, um, my plumber came round and he had a transit van and I got in his transit van and I was like, could you fit a dead body in here? And he was like, um, maybe. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was fun. If anybody has like large vans and cars and things that I'm always trying to say, well, would that, would that work and how big is that? And so yeah, that one was quite interesting. But no, I've never acted them out. No. I regularly ask my husband questions and he just doesn't engage. He just goes, no, I'm not answering this and walks out. <laughs> <laughs> very disappointing <laughs> <laughs> who reads your books first then uh, not him uh, who reads them first Ooh, uh, my editor to be honest usually um, if not my agent my editor normally my editor if I have a wobble so I had a wobble on one recently and my agent read it first and he said, yes, but change this, this and this. And then actually I gave it to one of my friends <clears throat> who's also a writer and he read it. And I said, should I ditch it or should I keep it? And he was like, no, 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 keep it. Um, and then it went to the my editor. Um, but normally it just goes straight to my editor. 
and nobody reads it. My husband reads it like when they're finished, usually. And even then, not so much. <laughs> uh, how does the family apart from the husband take your books? Uh, yeah, my mum really enjoys them. My dad really enjoys them. Uh, I've got very, my sister-in-law, my brother and on that side and my sister-in-law on that side, I think, have quite weak stomachs. So they don't tend to read them. <laughs> I think they're a bit behind. Um, yeah, so Aggie's just said, does my husband read books at, read or any books at all? Uh, no, only mine. And only then when I talk to him. He reads very boring um, finance management books. Very boring. Um, and my books. So no, he's got no comparison at all. He doesn't know anything about fiction. But yeah, the, the family's always been very supportive. My mother-in-law reads them. Um, my doctor friend who helps me, I give him a copy of every single one and he hasn't read a single one yet. He just keeps them, I think, in a big stack. <laughs> Bless him. Um, but he gets a, he gets a free copy. So, um, so Facebook user, where do they sit on the Gore score? Middle, middle of the road, I think. <laughs> not too... Not too bad, but not too good. I've written worse, far, far worse. <laughs> Is that under your other name that you published? The Morgory in that one, or Morgory as Louisa Scar? Uh, the Louisa Delange name. Mm. Much the same. Um, much the same. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Have I? I mean, they're quite gory. I mean, it, dep it depends where your scale sits. I mean, I, my scale's quite large. I'll, I'll read anything and, you know, um, so I think about sort of halfway. Halfway. Not too bad. It's uh, <laughs> a good answer. Memorable moments as an author. Oh, uh, I, my favourite bits are, so two, two, two things come to mind, actually. One was when I got an email from my, um, I was unpublished, had nothing, and I was sat in the library with my son, um, sat on the floor, because that's where you sit when you're in the library with a three-year-old, and I got an email from my agent saying that he wanted to meet and talk about the book, and I remember thinking, you know, I remember lying on the floor just thinking, oh, thank God, thank, you know, thank God this might actually go somewhere, um, and then I remember getting the contract for Canelo as well, and I was really, I remember doing a, a good air punch for that. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that was really good. Um, but generally in the process as a whole, I really like it when I get the covers for the first time because then you suddenly see what the publisher has in mind for the book and you're never really quite sure what they have in their head. But so I, I really liked when I got this one through, I was like, oh, OK, because I knew we were going to go for beach and sort of beach huts because I'd sent them a picture of Cowshot and said this is sort of where it's set. Um, but I didn't know that they would make it look like that. So I, I really liked that. Um, and then I really like getting the finished book. So when it comes through the door and it's like a proper book, I really like that. So, uh, yeah. And then when anybody says that they enjoy them, that's really nice as well. That works. Do you read all your reviews? Yeah. You shouldn't. I shouldn't. But, yeah, I do. I do, unfortunately. <laughs> Even the bad ones, but I'm quite, I'm quite good at ignoring the bad ones. So. What's the craziest review you've ever had? The craziest review uh, is Marion. See, I even remember her name. Uh, it was for The Dream Wife. So it was for, that was my first book. And she said she thought the author had mental problems. So that was nice. <laughs> I was like, thanks, thanks, Marion. Um, so yeah, that one, that one definitely comes to mind. What a thing to write in a review. I know, one star, obviously, but I was like, oh, that's a bit mean. But no, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. And she said she would never read such filth again. It wasn't even that bad in terms of filth, but anyway, she obviously thought it was. <laughs> Too much for Marion, maybe. Too much for Marion, yeah. Marion was not, was not going to read my book again. But yeah, that one definitely stuck in my mind. Generally, they, they've been okay. Uh, a lot of the time I read the one star reviews and they say, I don't know, something. And I, you kind of say, yeah, OK, I can take that on board. But don't do anything about it. <laughs> Can't do anything about it. The thing is, if somebody says I would change this and this, this it's, oh, I'm not going to reissue the book. I'm sorry. We're sort of stuck. 
I want to read the book Marion Slated. Yeah, yeah, it's called The Dream Wife. Wait a minute, let me get it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just show it off, we might get a sale. I know. That's it. There we go. It's called The Dream Wife. Same name. Well, different name. Louisa Delange. It's a bit weird. It's a bit bonkers. But it's fun. I really, I really like it. It's got a really good twist at the end. But yeah. <laughs> Marion did not think so. Yeah, Marion did not. So we no. um, we've all no. learned that Marion does not approve of your writing. Not for Marion, sadly. But yeah. Never mind. These things happen. Have you had any TV interest in any of your no. books? Sadly not. I would really like it. Um get Sam Worthington to play it and I would be very happy. But um, no, I know my agent tries. We um, got a bit of um, foreign interest. So I think Dream, this one's coming out in France at some point. Um, but but yeah, no, sadly not. But, uh, maybe they, one day. Are they translated in any other languages? Just that one? Um, I've had books translated in, uh, yeah, po Polish, Dutch. Uh, they come out in Polish, Dutch. And then I think there's going to be some in Slovenian, Slovenia, I think Russia, Swedish. I've lost track. But yeah, which is quite cool. I haven't seen them, but I think that's what's happening. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that'd be quite cool. Have I frozen? No, no, you're still fine. I've frozen on both screens. I've got two screens with my head and both of them are frozen. But anyway, tell me if I tell me if I completely freeze. You're still moving on our one. Oh, okay. That's all right then. Don't know what's going on. Why is this not working? Does the dog have any treats left? Is a good question. Yes, quite a few actually. But he's gone to. Oh no, he's woken up. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as he hears the treats, he wakes up. There you go, Maxie. He's given up. Really, he's given up with us. Yeah, shut the. He does. He does, he does tire after a while. Don't you, Max? Hey, you good boy. Yes, he's a good boy. All dogs are good dogs. Yeah. He's not sometimes, but generally uh, a good dog. And yeah. It's a known fact, even when they're not being good, they're still good dogs. <laughs> well, spend a day with Max and you'll soon, <laughs> you'll soon realise that that's not necessarily true. But yeah, he's all right. He's all right. Uh, so yeah, I tell my mum that about their dog. He's like a puppy and really naughty. And I'm like, he's just adorable. Yeah. I mean, he's a dog at the end of the day and he is still quite young. He's only 18 months, so... You know, it's not his fault. I mean, he does he does what he's trained to do. So if he, you know, <laughs> if I need to get him to behave better, I need to train him to do it. But you're a good boy. You're a good boy. Yes, you are. Yes. <laughs> and you've delighted our author chat tonight. So, I mean, that's excellent, isn't it? It's what, sorry? And we always love an author chat where a dog comes to visit, so. Yeah, well, otherwise I would just have to shut him in the other room and he he doesn't like that. He likes to be... He likes to be a part of the action, so yeah. He's happiest when he's... When you're here, aren't you, darling? Yes. He's looking at me now. <laughs> are your books out on audio? Uh, two of them are. Uh, so yeah, Last Place You Look and Under a Dark Cloud are definitely. We had them recorded. I'm not sure about whether they'll do the rest. Hopefully. I think we're seeing how they, how well they're received in audio but yeah that um a guy called david wayman did them both for me did a really good job they're great yeah they're both on audible i think was he your choice of voice because she gets to choose from a range of actors don't you when you do them he, yeah i had um four or five to choose from they decided to go with a male voice because obviously robin is sort of quite he's a big part of it um yeah so he was a bit it was kind of a bit weird because Robin's described, Robin comes from Devon and he's described as having, when he gets drunk, he's described as having a West Country accent. Um, so the, some of them in their wisdom when they were auditioning did him with a full West Country accent all the way through. <laughs> and I was just like, no, that's not how he sounds. <laughs> um, but so the guy that, that got it just did him with a, with a proper, just a, just a, what I would call a southern accent, um, and so yeah, it, it sounded a lot, a lot more 
like Robin, I guess, in my head. When he's when he talked, he sounded like Robin. So yeah, for that for me, that was that was the guy. But uh, yeah, it's quite fun to sort of listen to the audition tapes, see what they sound like. Have you have you listened to your audio book? Like <laughs> after it? No. No. I don't listen to audio generally, so I I think I'd be a very poor judge of whether it's good or bad. Um because I I'm not very good at concentrating on audiobooks. I switch off, my my brain wanders and then I come back and I've missed like a chapter. So I I don't listen. I don't listen to audio. I yeah. I listen to other things. I listen to podcasts and things like that, but yeah, I don't listen to No, I'm 100% the same. I don't listen to podcasts either. Um I can't like something like that. Yeah, I need to listen. If I'm listening, it's something that I can just miss great chunks of and it'll be fine um so yeah i haven't i haven't listened to them and then yeah i wouldn't be i'm sure they're great i'm sure they're really good but uh, they are like bits that i've heard of them are really good my husband reads quite like he'll he reads comics mostly but he does like audio books and i can't i just don't have the attention span no i don't i don't no, I don't really. I mean, I, I I often drift off when I'm reading normal books, but then you don't, you know, you just you're still there, um, so it's fine. But uh, yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> so yeah. just finish us off with a reminder of your books. Show okay. Covers and things again. Okay, covers and things. So I write the Butler and West series, um, featuring two detectives uh, called DS Robin Butler and DC Freya West and um, it all kicks off when at the beginning which is let's find it uh, with last place you look and it all kicks off they meet each other at the um, so Robin's called out to a suspicious death in a hotel room where a man is found dead a victim of an apparent sex game gone wrong so poor old Jonathan Miller and they investigate and uh, they soon discover that there's a lot of secrets that various people are keeping and not everything is as it seems um, and you get a lot of sort of background into Robin and Freya and that's the first time they're sort of getting to know each other and meeting each other and then um, Under a Dark Cloud is about it's a locked room mystery where Robin is called out and it's all very personal because the man found alive in the van with a dead body is his uh, best mate from home, a meteorologist called um, Dr. Finn Mason. And he knows that his best friend couldn't possibly have killed this person, but then who else did? Because there was only the two of them in this van and there was a storm and, and so what. So um, yeah, so it all gets a little bit, a little gets a little bit personal. And then the most recent one, which is this one, is Blink of an Eye and is about uh, five unresponsive bodies found on a beach and four of them survive and one is dead and it's about that investigation into what happened that night but also what happened 20 years before that meant that they never spoke again so yeah lots of fun good. and uh yeah hopefully you'll get invested in in freya and robin and their story and their relationship with each other because there's a big you know there's always yeah. a big will will they won't they theme all the way through and yeah i'm particular i'm a particular fan of robin so <laughs> uh and then all that's left to say is thanks for joining us and thanks no, thank you for her appearing as well like oh yeah Matt, he's now asleep oh. but yes thank you very much for having me it's uh, been a fun hour and thank you for everyone that's sort of engaged engaged with the questions and that's watched and uh, yeah i hope you enjoy the books I'm sure they will.